What is a trench watch? A watch to be taken to the trenches. A watch to be taken to the trenches of World War I. A watch to be worn under bombardment, under fire, when advancing on the enemy to count down to the moment, to go over the top to survive mud and rain, to be visible day or night. To arrive home on the wrist of a young officer, hero. To arrive home in the personal effects of one of the nine million killed. That is a trench watch. Ladies and gentlemen, we have something special on the bench today, a First World War trench watch. Listen, there is so much to deal with here. Pretty sure the mainspring is broken because no amount of winding does anything. Who knows what else we'll find in this 108-year-old movement. And I need to learn how to silver solder new wire lugs. And even if I do get it running, it needs a strap. In 1915, the defining feature of this watch was that it was worn on the wrist. We absolutely must give this watch that honor again. And we've not even begun to think about the hugely radioactive dial crumbling its toxic radium particles all over my watch shed. If any of us are going to have a chance to get home tonight, we need to get cracking on this now. No preamble, no wishing all a good morning, no hoping everyone is having a marvellous day. We do not have time for niceties of any kind at all. Any radium dust breathed in or swallowed gets treated by the body as calcium and is incorporated into one's bones, becoming the enemy within. Let us all avoid that. The usual first steps, out of the case, hands off, dial off, but this time while wearing gloves and a respirator mask. And then before we start on the movement, we'll need to decontaminate the work area. While we're getting this watch running again and wearable, we'll take a look at the company that made this watch and how it made its way into Great Britain. We'll look at who sold it and then the part this watch and others like it played in bringing the First World War to an end. You may be surprised how pivotal it was. As ever, the balance assembly is removed to avoid damaging its very delicate spring and pivots. Really don't want to damage a watch that's well over 100 years old. There are many watches described as trench watches solely because they were made in the first half of the 20th century and have wire lugs, but actual trench watches tend to have six specific attributes. First is size. Even though watches tended to be smaller, trench watches were over 30 millimeters in diameter. They tended to have the newly invented radium dial and hands and lots of it too. They were fitted with the new acetate crystals that watch sellers described as unbreakable. Their cases made use of screw down backs or bezels to improve water resistance. And they were worn on the wrist, which was unusual for men's watches at this time. Before the Great War, wrist watches known as wristlets, were worn by ladies. A gentleman would not wear a wristwatch in his day-to-day -day life. As the war progressed, a wristwatch became an essential item, not just for officers, but for other ranks too. By the end of the war in 1918, three out of five soldiers wore a wristwatch. Returning soldiers continued to wear their watches when not on active service, and the idea that a wristwatch was an effeminate affectation was forever banished. In December 1917, the Horological Journal, the journal of the British Horological Institute, noted that the wristlet watch was little used by the sterner sex before the war, but now is seen on the wrist of nearly every man in uniform and of many men in civilian attire. The development and use of combined arms warfare made the wrist watch a critical part of millions of troops kit it was combined arms warfare that finally, thankfully, defeated the preeminence of trench defences. An attack on an enemy position was no longer a matter of lobbing some artillery and then troops going over the top to face the enemy's machine guns. A combined arms attack might involve artillery, armour, 
light machine gun and trench mortar squads, sappers and engineers, infantry, and even the burgeoning flying corps. With very limited battlefield communication available in this period, synchronization of effort was critical. While some may argue it was a particular piece of new military hardware or tactic that defeated trench warfare, the one common element used by every unit, every officer, every section leader was a plan and a watch. In his book, Now It Can Be Told, war correspondent Philip Gibbs related a scene in Flanders, Belgium during August 1915. The men deployed before dawn waiting for the preliminary bombardment which would smash the way for them. The officers struck matches now and then to glance at their wristwatches, set very carefully to those of the gunners. Our artillery burst forth with an enormous violence of shell fire, so that the night was shattered with the tumult of it. The men listened and waited. As soon as the guns lengthened their fuses, the infantry advance would begin. Then the time came. The watch hands pointed to the second, which had been given for the assault to begin, and instantly, to the tick, the guns lifted and made a curtain of fire around the Chateau of Hooge, 600 yards away. Time! The company officers blew their whistles, and there was a sudden clatter from trench spades slung to rifle barrels, and from men girdled with hand grenades as the advancing companies deployed and made their first rush forward. What heroic madness! We're a few minutes into the video now. We've retained the high quality members of the audience, not those who skim through and jump to the time grapher at the end. I feel I'm talking very much to my people. Let's talk a little watchmaking before we get back to the history. I'm a little concerned about this one. From things like the wear around the wheels involved in setting the hands, I can see that this watch has seen a lot of use. Also, there's substantial wear to the gear train. What I'm saying is, when I put the watch into the vertical position on the time grapher and all the readings go south, I'm contending it's still a bloody good job, bloody well done. We're getting close to completing the disassembly and I've not even mentioned who made this watch yet. This watch was made by the Marvin Watch Company. I know what you're thinking with a name like Marvin, it's probably an American or British company. But no, it's not. It's actually Swiss. The Marvin Watch Company was created in 1850 by Swiss brothers, Mark and Emmanuel Didisheim, and was situated in St. Himier, Switzerland. At the time, Americans and British people tended to believe locally made watches were of higher quality than the Swiss made imports. Ah, just as I thought, a broken mainspring. I've already got a replacement, so we'll be able to get on. Anyway, where was I? Oh, yes, the Marvin Watch Company. Americans and British gentlemen and ladies didn't trust foreign brands, so the brothers came up with the name Marvin for their watches. This is exactly the type of chicanery of which I approve. Like so many Swiss watch brands, Marvin didn't survive the market consolidations driven by the quartz crisis and ceased to exist in the 1980s. However, in 2007, the brand was relaunched as a maker of mid-range luxury watches, focusing on the Chinese market. We'll pack everything away into the baskets for cleaning. It's good to follow the same system each time. Having a regime helps avoid doing something unhelpful, such as putting the delicate pallet fork into the same container as a heavy bridge or whatnot. While the watch movement is being cleaned, we can replace the lugs that are missing from the case. Allow me to confess that while I do not harbor an aversion for the delicate craft of horology, I am unaccustomed to the rugged pursuits of the metallurgical craft. This impending endeavor presents me with a novel undertaking wherein simplicity, one might surmise, awaits its eager embrace. If we may utilize a lexicon of a more direct persuasion, I must candidly admit, I do not know what I'm bloody doing.
That seems about right, and it fits into the holes where the original lugs once resided. Now brush some flux onto the working area and we'll heat that so it does. It's boiling and splattering before the solder is in place. And we can add some solder paste. The challenge is, I'm doing this a couple of millimetres from the hinge. That is also soldered in place. We've got the lowest melting point silver solder in the hope that it melts before the hinge drops off. That seems to be it. Into what us metal workers call a pickle solution to clean the scale and we're done. The watch is out of the cleaner. We can start the rebuild now. Even though we're fitting a new mainspring that comes pre-lubricated, we'll put a small amount of oil into the barrel. Fitting a new mainspring is easy in two ways. It's easy to do just push it down and it's easy to get it very wrong and end up in a mess. The critical point is to focus all of the effort on the outside coil. If that is in place, the rest will follow. And check and check again that the whole spring is in before lifting the retaining ring. There's more energy in an average coiled mainspring than an angry swan's wing and we all know what damage that can do. We'll turn the arbor and confirm the hook has engaged the spring. After pushing down the lid, we always check the arbor hasn't been pinched and is free to move. If anyone has seen an off-center bottom plate for a barrel before, please do let me know. Looking at this is actually making feel dizzy. Is this normal? I don't think so. We'll get the wheels in now, starting with the escape wheel. Then the fourth wheel. This has an extra long pivot that the second hand sits on. The third wheel doesn't have a glamorous job like the other wheels, but let's not underestimate the value it brings to the watch. The second wheel turns exactly one time an hour and holds the minute hand via the cannon pinion. On watches of this age, they've been serviced so many times that the pins that locate the top bridges in place have become slightly distorted. That means one must apply substantial force to get the bridge into position. 
The one thing one doesn't really want to do when there are delicate pivots to be correctly positioned at the same time. Care and patience are the watchwords of the day. Putting the train of wheels bridge in place is one of those jobs that can take a few seconds or long enough to necessitate two cups of tea and a hot buttered crumpet. Unfortunately, this one went straight on. The barrel bridge is a simpler affair. The main issue is forgetting to put the setting lever screw in place first, which is something we've remembered not forget this time. The post for the crown wheel is quite badly worn. We'll still give it a little oil, but not sure how much it's really helping. Now the click, this is slightly unusual. The click spring is under the bridge. I guess the spring needs to be held down here while the click is fitted. Holding it out of the way with an oiler might do it. That'll do! Excellent! The ratchet wheel is pretty straightforward, though we do need to get the centre fitted over the square main spring arbour and the teeth engaged with the crown wheel and the teeth engaged with the click all at the same time before we can screw it down. But nothing is going to break or ping off into a parallel universe, so no stress. Pallet fork next, all the usual rules apply. No daydreaming. No assuming it would all be okay. Keep frosty, people. With the pallet fork locking the train of wheels, we can apply a wind to the mainspring and check that the pallet is getting a kick from the escape wheel. It's this kick that the pallet transfers to the balance wheel, creating ticks and keeping time.
We'll apply an infinitesimally small amount of the world's most expensive grease to the pallet stones. You've not really had the full watchmaking experience until you felt a burning sense of injustice over how expensive everything is. We walk the pallet to share the lubrication with the escape wheel teeth. Now we can fit the balance and see how we're doing. Will the old boy be up for a final hurrah? Fitting the balance is a challenge due to the state of the steady pins. I've got to push the balance cock into place while not destroying the balance pivots. Trying to hold it with the pivot in place while screwing it down. This could most definitely kill this watch if it goes wrong. Yes, yes, excellent, marvellous. That is very satisfying indeed. 108 years old and back up and ticking. Usual 9010 oil for the escape, fourth and third wheel, and D5 for the second wheel. Well, I say usual, Usual for me. Lubricating watches correctly is a huge subject with many options to choose from. Normally, I'd remove the balance now while I assemble the keyless and motion works on the other side of the watch. But due to the difficulty fitting the balance and risk of damage, I'm going to take the less chancy option, at least I hope it is, and leave the balance in place. Those of a sharp-witted countenance will have noticed I did not remove, clean and lubricate the balance wheel cap jewels. In truth, the screws holding these in place have been mangled by a previous watchmaker, so I've taken the less risky route of leaving them alone, though I am not at all happy. The cannon pinion is the unsung hero of the watch movement. It grips the second wheel pivot. Remember the one that turns once an hour. It grips the wheel pivot with just the right amount of force, so it turns with the wheel as the watch ticks. But it's loose enough to slip when the watch is in hand setting mode, so you can set the correct time. Always best to get the setting lever on its screw before fitting the rest of the winding hardware. Sliding pinion and clutch next. It's a good idea to put a little grease on the back of the clutch as this part rubs on the main plate and does cause wear. Light lubrication on the winding stem. Remember, we're greasing a finely engineered mechanism, not slathering a hot crumpet in butter. Now the yolk, small drop of oil on the pivot and some grease where the yolk spring engages. This yolk spring looks ridiculously powerful. Anything could happen. I've cleared the workshop of bystanders and got my wife's number ready on speed dial. I'm going in.
Just the rest of the motion works wheels and the cover plate to go and that's the watch movement done. Starting to get a little excited. This is an interesting design. There's no setting lever spring. That job is being done by the interaction of the yoke and setting lever. The setting lever spring is a common weak point in watches and often breaks. I like this. We'll fit a new crystal now using UV setting adhesive. Plonk the glass into place and then we'll put it in the UV chamber to cure. We'll only take a few minutes. This is actually designed to cure nail varnish, but my advice is don't put any part of yourself in here unless you want it to drop off. I am by inclination a deeply lazy man and I'm trying to find excuses not to work on the dial, but I think we need to give this watch its loom back. Let's build it up in layers to try and bring back that look of heavily applied old radium. The surface of enamel dials are quite robust. This can be easily removed if need be. That's looking pretty good. If I saw that on a dial, I'd definitely be getting the Geiger counter out. Watch movement done, watch glass done, dial done, wire lugs done. Let's get this on the time grapher and see how we did. But wait, we promised this watch would once again be worn on a wrist. We need a strap. I thought the simplest way to find a strap would be to ask David from the marvelous YouTube channel, Saving Time, to make one. He bloody went and bloody did exactly that. And even better, here he is doing it. Thank you, Alec. It's a pleasure to be invited onto Gentleman's Watch Services, and if memory serves, this is the first time I've ever been invited to something with Gentleman in the title. Now, we need a strap for this watch, and it's actually kind of tricky because of the very small lug size. So I'm going to be using two different types of leather. This full grain Italian Saffiano pattern here, which looks a little bit like canvas, and this vintage style pull-up leather. Now, I think these will work remarkably well together. Now, I'm not going to do what I normally do, which is a lot of prep work, templates and all of that stuff. I'm going to fly a little bit by the seat of the pants here. I want to make something 
that looks like it was made in a rush that looks like it could have come out of a trench so in order to facilitate that I'm not going to use anything fancy I'm going to use a bunch of household objects the kind of thing anyone would have had access to coins knives rulers that kind of thing to try and create what is a Kitchener style strap now the point behind these straps were because of that tiny lug size 12 millimeters in a lot of cases on these military watches if you just have the top strap the one i'm creating out of the green saffiano leather here it will tend to bend and be uncomfortable on the wrist so some padding was put behind the strap as well in order for that not to happen so i'm going to mark the center point on the watch now there are a lot of cuts that need to be made with this style strap and normally a template would be handy but as i said I'm trying to keep this one kind of as raw as possible in keeping with the video and the theme of the time. Now, if you look at some of the pictures from the First World War, especially in what we're interested in, the watches of the guys that were there, a lot of them were simply strapped to the wrist with old boot laces, shoelaces. It seems like that trench warfare, as well as being very, very hard on the people, was also very hard on the equipment. So even if you'd started out as an officer with a stipend from the military to buy yourself something nice, after a few weeks, months, or perhaps even years in a trench, it looks like you needed to get a bit improvisy with how your watch stayed on your wrist. And that's what I'm trying to do here. So I'm trying to make something that could have been put together by somebody who had a very limited amount of tools and materials. So kind of old ammo bag leather and a bit of canvas would be my basis for this strap so the slots you can see me cutting here are actually for the green strap to pass through the brown strap that will keep the two parts of the strap together and this is deceptively difficult it looks simple but if you slip in the slightest and make a nick along one of those slots you're starting this strap again and you need to cut quite a lot of slots as you can see also, the green, well, in our canvas strap, uh, will need to be thinned just so you can get a buckle on there. Now, as well as creating something period correct, I also wanted to give Alex something he could actually wear. So I will be tarting this strap up a little bit, but nowhere near as much as I would normally do. There's no liner on this, for instance. There would normally be a liner on a modern strap on these ones. There was when they were bought from the store. A lot of the surviving examples don't have them anymore. A lot of liners were added after the fact. It's just a case of the guys used whatever they could get their hands on and whatever worked. So I want to create sort of a half and half, something a modern guy could wear, but still inspires that kind of this was created at the same time period as the watch and i hope i've been somewhat successful with that but i'll leave you lot to judge on that one so i'm actually going to stitch this strap now there's no liner so the stitching's not strictly necessary it will act as a little bit of reinforcement but the main reason I'll stitch this strap is A, because it looks nice, and B, some time ago, one of you guys made the mistake of telling my other half that she looked very talented when she was doing the stitching, and now she insists on being in every video. And I am not sleeping in the dog bed, so we're going to put some stitches in this thing. Also, I'm going to crease the edges with an electronic creaser, just again, because it looks nice and Alec has to wear it. And I want to give him something that looks period correct, but does have a few modern touches, because after all, we are not actually in a trench here. So crease all the leather, both on the larger portion of the back strap and the strap, and those will come together quite nicely. And now I really like this combination of colors. I think it looks fantastic. Also, when this is waxed and oiled, uh, it will also really start to tie together. A lot of the marks you can see on it will disappear. So I'm going to bang some holes in for the stitches. I'm then going to turn you over to my better half who's going to stitch it. Um, she does most of the leather stitching when we do this kind of thing. Finish that off with a smaller punch here. Nothing I'm sure most of you haven't seen before, but there we go, ready for stitching. 
Now, after this has been stitched, I'm not going to show it on camera because I genuinely don't want to take up too much of your time here on somebody else's YouTube channel. But after this is stitched, I'm going to go ahead and burnish all the edges, both the outer edges of both straps and all of the edges in the holes there. So we get a more harmonious look. I've also gone ahead and put a little bit of wax on this. Now I used beeswax because it really is what they would have used at the time amongst other things but they certainly would have had access to a basic beeswax so I think this came up really really nice it looks vintage it looks old now you'll also note that there are no holes at the end of the strap for the buckle that's because I've left that to Alec I'll let him punch the holes for the buckle there at the end of the strap so he gets the perfect fit and it threads through like so and then the watch goes in the middle like a nato strap so i hope you enjoyed the making of this thank you again alec for inviting me on and cheers guys alec back to you thank you david and thank you the lovely david's better half it's a beautiful strap that gives this old warrior its rightful place now there's no avoiding it let's see how it's running That is great amplitude for such an old watch, and the trace is really clean. This is without any regulation, just a minute a day slow. To reiterate, this is a well-worn 108-year-old watch. Amazing. One more thing. What happens in a vertical position? Very much as expected. The amount of wear in this watch really shows in the vertical positions. But it's still within a few minutes a day. The old soldier is still fighting. That's it for today. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did making it. Do have a marvelous day.